Okay, so I make that just past the hour. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from today and welcome to this TWIST Bioscience webinar. My name is Chris Thorne and I'm Senior Manager for Field Marketing here at TWIST. Uh, so before we begin, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, as you've probably noticed, uh, all lines are muted during this, but there will be time at the end for questions. And if I can ask you to put your questions into the Q&A box, uh, which you'll find at the bottom of your, your Zoom interface, uh, rather than the chat box, and then we can get to those at the end. Following the presentation, uh, if you've got a minute, we'll send you to a brief survey, and we'd really appreciate any feedback that you can offer on, on this webinar, and this just helps us to improve each time. Okay, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Um, first up, you're going to meet Aaron Sato, who's our Chief Scientific Officer uh, of the Biopharma bio Vertical at Twist Bioscience. Prior to Twist, Aaron served as CSO at Lake Pharma, uh, leading the California Antibody Center, and also oversaw all discovery research functions, both as Vice President of Protein Sciences at Sarazen, and previously as Vice President of Research at Sutro Biopharma. And today, Aaron is uh, going to be joined by Noah Ditto, who is the Technical Product Manager at Cartera. Prior to joining Cartera in 2014, Noah supported drug discovery and early clinical development for nearly a decade at Bristol Myers Squibb, with a focus on biophysical characterization of protein and peptide based biomarkers, drug targets, and therapeutics. Okay, so Aaron, I'm going to hand over to you and let you take it from here. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks, Chris. Can... Uh, so again, uh, as Chris mentioned, um, I head up the Twist Biopharma Vertical at Twist Bioscience, and today I'm going to give you an overview um, of how um, uh, we can use again a lot, a lot of different technologies, but in particular the Cartera LSA platform to help us in our antibody discovery efforts, as well as in uh, helping uh, assessing antibodies for diagnostic testing. And so I'm going to start out the first part of my talk, give you kind of an overview of Twist Biopharma. Um, talk about in a specific example using uh, trying to find antibodies to the, uh, COVID, in particular SARS-CoV-2 S1. Um, and then I'm going to pause, hand it over to Noah, who's then going to uh, give you a fantastic overview of the Cartera LSA system. And then I'm going to pick it up and kind of show you how we then use the Cartera as a uh, interrogate all the antibodies that we discovered against the SARS-CoV-2 S1 protein. So I'll take it away. Okay, so again, I always say that the best companies out there really understand the one thing they're really good at. And so for Twist, that's our ability to print DNA. So on this silicon chip in the middle of the screen is this, uh, we can basically print up to a million individual oligos of up to 300 base pairs in length. And so it's basically a fantastic system for making uh, discrete oligo pools. So we can basically make uh, pools of oligos, you know, as I said, up to 300 base pairs in length where we can um, use those pools of oligos to then make all kinds of fantastic um, custom DNA products. Uh, custom clonal genes are, is the number one product in the Symbio space. You can go online, order any gene you wish, up to 5 kb loaded into any vector you wish. We also have a whole line of NGS products where we use oligo pools for um, uh, sample enrichment ahead of NGS sequencing. Um, but actually the, the use of these oligo pools from building libraries is actually key and central to the twist by a farmer vertical. So I'm going to jump into that now and kind of show you how we use um, oligo pools to generate fantastic DNA libraries. So again, in the past, when people have made uh, DNA libraries, they typically have used degenerate algos to encode for diversity um, and use those to then very specific regions of say like uh, say a protein, like an antibody, for example. Um, here, I'm not using a degenerate algo to do that. I can actually use, again, pools of discrete sequences. So, so let's say hundreds of thousands of uh, variants of a particular region of a protein. Um, and I can basically piece together those algo pools to create a hypervariable um, library. And so that gives me really tight control over the bases that are used at each of the positions in that library, as well as the codons. Um, in the case of an antibody, I can, I, I can also very easily vary the lengths of CDRs because again, I can just print different lengths, different length oligos in my alga pools. Um, I also can rest, uh, uh, avoid restriction sites, of course, and unwanted motifs as I build the library. And it gives me, again, really precise control that it's not really a uh, uh, possible to do with uh, a degenerate oligo. And then also in the case of uh, uh, antibody libraries, we, we also potentially can use multiple germline scaffolds and give us really tight control of the amino acids that are used in those CDR loops. And then finally, not last but not least, the very end, we actually validate all of our libraries with next generation sequencing to make sure that the original design actually matches up with the final product that we create. 
So again, how do we use now Alga pools to generate an antibody library, for example? So again, if you think of an antibody domain is basically either a heavy chain or a light chain, it's basically a collection of three loops or CDR loops. Um, I can, again, I can just make an Alga pool that has discrete CDR sequences of defined sequences um, and basically uh, make that a pool for each of the different CDR loops and then piece them together to create a hypervariable domain. So in the case of a human antibody library, I can, I can basically make pools of algos that encode for CDR1, 2, and 3 diversities derived from natural human sequence. So even though it's a synthetic library, um, it's very natural in its design. And then I can piece that together in the context of a single human germline framework. As I do that, I also can remove sequences up front from those algo pools that might have liabilities. So at the end of the day, I have a fully human antibody library that has human frameworks as well as human CDRs and then is devoid of any kind of liabilities um, in those sequences. And then finally, if I choose to, I'm not gonna talk, really talk about it today. I also can uh, encode for specific motifs in those CDR sequences as well. So uh, Twist Bioformat, we're a division of Twist Bioscience. We're focused on utilizing this fantastic library platform I just talked about to create our own antibody libraries in phage display. Um, to help pharma and biotech companies discover, um, as well as optimize antibodies using a platform that we call TAU, which stands for Twist Antibody Optimization. It's also, again, a, a fantastic uh, technology where we couple our library technology I just talked to you about with some software that we have to create an optimization library where you can shuffle natural human diversity around your specific lead. So just on a high level, um, as I mentioned, um, we're using this library platform to create a whole suite of different uh, libraries. I call it my library of libraries, where we just have libraries on the shelf that we can pull down and basically interrogate any target we wish um, uh, um, as we work with our partners. We're also, again, very open to licensing out these libraries as well. Um, and so all the libraries that we have today are shown here. So first of all, um, we have our fully human fab library called our hyperimmune library. I'll talk about this later in terms of the COVID example. I'll, uh, I'll cite it. again, it's, this, this was, library was very useful in finding a number of different fully human antibodies against the SARS-CoV-2 S1 protein. We also have a whole series of VHH um, uh, single domain libraries as well, four different ones that again, we used for the COVID example I'll show later, that again, also gave fantastic leads um, against the virus. And then we have several other libraries derived from either um, um, antibodies in the, pub, in the PDB, which is our structural antibody library. We have a whole series of libraries focused on difficult to drug targets like G protein coupled receptors, ion channels and carbohydrates. And again, we can continue to expand and innovate um, and create more and more libraries because again, I, I sit inside this uh, fantastic DNA company. It's very easy for me to innovate and create uh, new library content. And so we actually put out new libraries on a monthly basis. So we will continue to add to our library of libraries. Okay, so now I'll jump into the, the COVID example. So again, for COVID, um, you know, there's really, um, there's multiple strategies you can use to combat the virus, but uh, the, probably the primary one is that uh, a lot of people are trying to find antibodies to the S1 spike protein on the surface of the virus. Um, again, as we all know, um, the spike protein actually binds ACE2 on our lung epithelium. Um, and that's its mode of entry and infection as part of the disease. So um, in addition to trying to find antibodies to the spike protein, we also undertook an effort to find antibodies to ACE2. So I'm really trying to see if we could block either the virus itself or actually block the entry point um, of the virus into our cells. So those are the two uh, strategies that we took. And as part of it, you know, the car tear was, was key and central to our, us interrogating all those antibodies because it allows us to assess their uh, affinity as well as epitope in terms of their binding. So again, most of my career has been mostly uh, focused on finding antibody therapeutics. Um, but you know, I, I, from time to time, I have done a fair amount of work in diagnostics as well. It does take you, to, uh, it, it does force you to kind of think in a different way um, compared to typically how you think when you're developing a therapeutic. Um, and I just, I thought it'd be helpful to kind of uh, go through to the design criteria for a therapeutic versus the diagnostic now. So for a therapeutic, of course, you're looking for high affinity. Sometimes you might actually want pan reactivity in the sense that you might want to hit multiple members of the same family, or maybe you might want to hit like mouse human sino versions of the same protein. Um, and also in many cases, you're trying to find an antibody to a functional epitope. For example, you're trying to find an antibody that blocks a specific receptor ligand interaction. 
And, but then when you think about uh, diagnostics, and so again, that would apply to in applying that to SARS-CoV-2, you'd want to find a, perhaps a very high affinity antibody that had pan-reactivity to multiple strains of the virus, and of course, blocked its interaction with ACE2. But when we think about diagnostics, um, it's, it's slightly different. Um, so of course, high affinity is still a really important um, uh, requirement for a diagnostic antibody to be used. And, uh, say either an ELISA or some sort of lateral flow test. Um, but in this case, and rather than having pan reactivity against maybe a whole series of different strains in the case of SARS-CoV-2 or maybe older strain, older viruses that are related, here for diagnostics, you actually want high selectivity. So actually have antibodies that are very selective for say SARS-CoV-2 over the original SARS virus because you wanna make a test that only picks up that specific strain of the virus. Um, and also, um, rather than just have focus in on functional epitopes, we might want to have antibodies that bind multiple places on the target protein um, that don't overlap. And they may not need to be functional because we're just trying to find, say, for example, a sandwich pair where we can pick up and you know, capture and then also detect a particular antigen. And as I'll show later, the Cartera is actually ideal to help us get all of this data to address high affinity, high selectivity, and multiple epitopes. Okay, so now I'll jump into my, again, the case study. So again, um, we developed a number of libraries, um, either libraries on the shelf or libraries that we created specifically for, for COVID um, to address the pandemic. So the first one is we, uh, we announced back in March that we, had a collab we have a collaboration with Vanderbilt where they gave us a whole series of um, se sequences derived from a COVID-19 convalescence patient. Um, we use those sequences to design a fully human synthetic library that basically mimics the antibody repertoire seen in that patient. And then we use that library to pan and screen against the SARS-CoV-2 S1 spike protein. Okay, so we did a whole series of different uh, pannings against the SARS-CoV-2 S1 protein, as well as ACE2, as I talked about before. Um, we used our fully human fab hyperimmune library. We used the COVID-19 um, uh, patient library I just talked about in collaboration with Vanderbilt. And then we also used all of our single domain libraries, um, our human single domain libraries against uh, SARS-CoV-2 S1. All of our libraries have more than 10 billion different antibodies, um, and we uh, panned and screened them for uh, roughly three to four rounds. And at the end of that, we picked um, well over a thousand clones for each of the different outputs. Because I sit inside of a, again, a great, fantastic DNA company, we're able to very quickly clone all those genes, express them using our high throughput IgG alpha product offering. Um, and then we were able to then uh, very quickly uh, test them for affinity in the car terras LSA, as well as put them through a whole battery of other tests for looking at receptor ligand blockade, as well as the developability assessment. And as a part of this, we were able to also get a lot of data um, on all the different antibodies, some of which were functional, some of which are not, that could potentially be used for diagnostic applications. So again, the, our hyperimmune library, it's a full human fab library. It's, it's based off of a single human uh, heavy chain light chain germline scaffold of VH323V V kappa 139. Um, it actually has a huge amount of diversity um, in the heavy chain CDR3 register of the library. Again, I, what I wanted to do with this library is build a library that no one else had ever built before that was really enabled by the twist alga pools technology to build libraries. And so um, as part of the library, it actually has an alga pool of over two and a half million heavy chain CDR3s derived from uh, NGS data from uh, human naive and memory B cells. So if you believe again that the main determinant in binding of an antibody is the heavy chain CDR3, then putting the most diversity into that region makes, of the antibody makes the most sense. So we uh, spent a lot of time and we took over a writer for about a week and a half to basically uh, you know, synthesize an alga, a huge alga pool for this one particular region of the antibody and we put it into the the library and we also put in again additional diversity into the other regions of the antibody as well to create a final library of roughly uh, 10 billion different antibodies in a fab based phage mid library we also have um, several again as i mentioned uh, vhh single domain libraries we again use them um, in this COVID example as well um, uh, the two that i'll talk about today are what we call our vhh human shuffle and our vhh human shuffle hyperimmune library. Um, they're both built off of a, a humanized uh, uh, VHH DP47 framework. So again, they could be directly used for therapeutics. And as our design set, we actually took in a whole series of uh, llama CDR, llama VHHs that were uh, over 3,000 of them that were actually derived from a database that had um, 
or each of those 3,000 different VHHs had a defined uh, target that they bound to. And so we basically uh, took all of those CDR uh, sequences derived from those um, VHHs and created the two libraries that I show here on the screen. So the first one, as I said, the VHH Human Shuffle, we, put this, we, took, we took all of the CDRs from the database and we basically created an alga pool for each one of the different CDR regions. Um, and then we basically shuffled the CDR diversities in the context of this humanized uh, DP47 framework. So much like uh, back in the day when people would do heavy chain light chain shuffling of human sequences to get unique human antibodies that would bind human targets, here I'm doing that on a CDR level and shuffling natural llama CDRs in the context of a uh, humanized framework. The VHH8 uh, uh, shuffle hypermune is one, extent, one step further. So we basically took that first um, H shuffle library and then replaced the CDR3 uh, sequences with actually the, the large alga pool derived from the hypermune library that I talked about before. So rather than have llama CDRs in the CDR3 position of the library, we now have uh, fully human heavy chain CDR3s in the CDR3 register. So that gives us an even more um, human-like uh, VHH that we can actually find and uh, find VHH leads to any target we wish. So again, as we go through our discovery process, we typically, again, take this, we either construct a new library like we did with the Vanderbilt library for using the COVID uh, sequences, or we just take a library off the shelf like the Hypermune or the VHH libraries I just talked about. We do cell or bead-based uh, pannings and screening against the target, um, typically in ELISA if it's a recombinant protein. We then sequence all of our hits. And then, as I said, since we sit inside of a DNA company that um, can make clonal genes very fast, we reformat all of our genes to, to IgG and then scale up those DNAs. We have a high throughput IgG offering now as well, where we can make hundreds, thousands of antibodies, and then we, put, we port those antibodies into binding and functional assays. Um, as, as it relates to diagnostics, we also put them through a whole series of other tests um, on the Carterra to help us uh, uh, narrow down and bin these antibodies into different binding, uh, binding bins to enable us to see which ones would be amenable for uh, use in diagnostics. So um, this just shows you some initial data on the first two, the hypermune library and the VHH library is showing you that we can be pan and screen them against the S1 protein and we saw really nice enrichments um, of titers as we went to successive rounds. And then at the end, we actually picked clones from rounds three and four to do phagelizes to, to pull out all of our positives against each of the different targets. We've got fantastic signal to background ratios um, for um, uh, each of the two libraries I just mentioned for the for the hyperimmune library, as well as for the uh, SARS-CoV-2 COVID library that we created with Vanderbilt. Um, so again, we took all the positives from the ELISA and, and moved them ahead um, for further for further testing. We also did a um, once we had all those sequences, we actually interrogated and put them through a whole series of other um, assays. One assay that we did in ELISA was just to see whether. Um, first of all, just again, uh, reconfirm bindings. So around the outside of the will, we actually plotted that ELISA signal and we're seeing again, really great target to background ratios for all the various clones. We also wanted to see whether any of the antibodies were competed off by um, the natural ligand of the S1 spike protein, which of course is ACE2. So as you can see, um, those that have blue um, around the outside of the will, we can actually see that um, they actually are competed off by um, ACE2. And then on the inside of the wheel, we actually plotted how their sequences are related to one another into different sequence families, um, particularly driven by their heavy chain CDR3 sequence. And you can see that we have a number of different uh, clonotypes uh, within our uh, different sequences that we discovered against SARS-CoV-2 S1. Okay, so now I'm gonna transition over to Noah. Noah's gonna give you an overview of the Cartera platform. And then once you hear about that, I'll show you how we then use the Cartera to interior all the antibodies derived from um, the discovery efforts I just talked about. All right. Thank you, Aaron. And thank you for everyone that's on the call. So I've got my slides coming up now and there we go. So uh, just to quickly introduce myself again, I'm Noah Ditto. I'm technical product manager at Cartera. And today, um, kind of as Aaron's alluded to, I'd like to give everybody an introduction to the LSA platform and some details about how the system works um, and, and much and right after my sort of presentation here, you'll hear from Aaron, um, an actual application uh, at Twist using the system. 
So really, really, when it comes down to antibody discovery, um, just like Aaron has shown in his previous slides, there are awesome tools out there to generate antibodies. Um, all that is very elegant, um, really orders of magnitude above what analytical tools have historically been able to achieve in terms of matching the throughput there. Um, and, and characterization is a necessity. Um, it, there's no point in generating uh, all these high quality uh, potential therapeutics or diagnostics if there's no way um, to really to really leverage them and, and, and otherwise, as it's been done previously, oftentimes we sort of discard um, quality candidates for a lack of the ability to handle them in terms of throughput. So to, to meet this need is Cartera's LSA platform. Um, it's a novel system based on SPR detection technology. And really what's novel about it is the fact that it has a, a Fluidix uh, configuration that allows either 96 channel multi-printing or single channel injections across the array. Uh, so the instrument has this dynamic within itself that it creates arrays of up to 384 species on a biosensing chip surface and can flow one injection um, across that simultaneously. Um, so where other platforms historically in the SPR space may give you two, maybe four um, kind of signals per injection, um, we're taking that up to 384 signals per injection. So a tremendous leap in terms of throughput. And I'll give you guys a little synopsis here of how each side of the instrument works. So multi-channel mode on the left-hand side of your screens, you can see that our sampler drawing 96 samples at a time and our proprietary printhead technology flowing those samples onto the surface to create um, in SPR parlance, the ligands. And then in the next step, our single channel docks across this array that was built and injects um, an analyte across it to measure real-time binding using very minimal amounts of sample to do so. Collectively, what this, this novel configuration means is that a lot of the traditional ways that um, antibody discovery and characterization were carried out, which were kind of a linear stepwise process um, with multiple assays and multiple platforms, um, many of them collapsed down on the LSA. Um, there's really uh, the ability to run high numbers of samples early on in the discovery phase, get the most information possible um, using material quantities that are consistent with those available in early discovery phase. So I'll jump right into the assays themselves. So one of the core assays that Aaron will be showing you data on shortly is the kinetics assay, measuring real-time binding kinetics of typically an antibody and an antigen. Um, in these exercises, up to 1,152 antibodies can be screened in a single experiment using three 3D four-well plates of antibodies. The antibody itself is um, attached to the biosensor surface, and then we come in with a titration of antigen most commonly. Um, to, to measure the interaction, the, the kinetic rate constants. Uh, some advantages of this assay are it's highly parallel so that we're measuring a single injection of antigen to 384 antibodies simultaneously. So there's no disparity of changes in the antigen over time or any other factors that may influence kind of the comparability of the measurement. Um, and also the, the array capacity is significant here. Um, so, so while maybe there may not be 384 unique clones potentially, it can be arrayed at one time. There's the ability to build in replicates, um, which is kind of unprecedented in SPR. Really, uh, typically, especially early on in screening kind of assays, uh, replicates are just not feasible on most platforms. So the LSA really changes the data quality that you can get early on. Um, that, that same array capacity can also be leveraged to titrate the ligands on the surface. So trying different surface densities within a single experiment and then choosing the best um, data ultimately for kinetic analysis um, again, is something that really wasn't done historically. Uh, you know, most biosensors required um, a day or two of just assay optimization and then running the actual experiment once optimized. In the case of the LSA, it's kind of a one and done process on our system. And really this is what we're chasing in the end, um, high throughput kinetics. So 384 ligands are shown here within each of these individual tiles is eight member titration. Um, all done in a single run. This is actually a screenshot from the software itself, kind of flagging um, data that's maybe borderline. Maybe we have lower signals or complex fitting going on, but really capturing the breadth of, of the data. And this is, uh, for this single set of data here, this is maybe a six hour runtime. So quite fast to get 384 um, affinities with good confidence. 
And as I alluded to previously, um, there's the ability to, to build in replicates into your assays on the system. And we find that we actually get really, really good quality um, reproducibility on the system. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at these replicates. And so we can look at the individual rate constants, calculated mean standard deviations for these 12 uh, replicates. Um, and we get high, high agreement amongst all of them, showing that you can build in replicates, get to statistical confidence in your assay, um, and, and make meaningful inferences of the data at a very early stage, obviously. And maybe to build upon that is always the question, well, we have good reproducibility within the assay, but really how does this data, how do these measured affinities translate um, outside of just this individual assay? Um, so from an accuracy perspective, we'd say they, they agree very well. So Viacore, for example, is a um, well-established platform that most people reference when looking at label-free binding. Um, there's been an excellent uh, paper put out this past year um, by folks at Atomab and uh, Anjan looking at, um, among other things, kind of benchmarking of different SPR platforms and, and kinetic rate constants. Um, and the LSA was right in step with, um, you know, what would be arguably the, the sort of gold standard of, of um, SPR, showing very good agreement both um, with individual rate constants as well as calculated affinities. And my plot shown here is, is affinity measurements for 36 clones. Um, the one difference being obviously that um, the LSA is significantly faster, uses much, much less sample, um, and, and can finish up these types of assays in a day or so um, versus uh, multiple days um, and multiple runs to achieve the same throughput. Um, so, so not only do you have speed, but you have confidence in the measurements you're making. So with that, I'll shift to epitope binning. So of the two, two main um, applications that customers seek out on the LSA, um, one being kinetics, epitope binning is the other. Epitope binning is a sort of pairwise exercise where we take antibodies and compete them against each other to determine if they can form a trimolecular complex um, uh, with the antigen um, in, in the assay format. And, and really the goal of this is to, to sort of group antibodies in what's called bins um, or communities um, it, it's very advantageous early on to kind of identify diversity in the sets and maintain that diversity going forward um, as, as candidates progress in a therapeutic discovery example. Um, and the really neat part about this is there's so much information generated from these assays um, that it, it maybe changes the mindset of, of drug discovery where historically it's been kind of a funnel process where we're trying to just get rid of the, you know, the, the high numbers and will, will the numbers down to something that's manageable to now we look at it as more of a sampling um, kind of strategy where you have all this detail about epitope and it's basically there banked, ready to call up at any point as particularly as um, maybe a therapeutic discovery program as the objectives evolve, maybe there's new marketing strategies, the biology says to go in a different direction. This data is captured for, uh, you know, hundreds if not almost thousands of clones early on and, and able to be called up quite easily. Um, and one of the nice things that um, I, I think Aaron is gonna touch on a bit is, is binning also allows us to get details on sandwiching pairs in these assays. Um, so we have a lot of information, real-time binding profiles of two antibodies um, forming a sandwich, um, one being immobilized, one in solution. Um, and obviously this lends itself very well to, um, for example, diagnostics or you know, assay development. So epitope binning, the nuts and bolts of it, um, the main drivers of where the, the customer value is with this is low sample requirements and throughput that's really um, completely transform transformative um, in the field. Uh, so, so as I mentioned, the, the LSA can array up to 300 antibodies on the surface. And then in this binning experiment, we would bring in an injection of the antigen in each cycle and an injection of one of those 384 antibodies. So for each injection, we're measuring competition against 384 species. Um, and in total, this, this is over 147,000 interactions measured in a single experiment, um, which is it's a huge, um, huge number of data points, huge uh, detail about the, the candidates um, that you're testing. Um, great things about it, obviously, are the low antibody requirements. So this fits in very well with an early stage um, Part of a program where there's not a lot of material to be spread around, you know, when we consider all the different assays that need to be run and, and resource limitations. Um, and even antigen levels are exceedingly low. I mean, we're under 200 micrograms typically for one of these binning assays. 
Um, so again, well aligned with um, the scenarios typically um, encountered in early drug discovery. And then on the back end of it, we have our proprietary Epitope software package, which is really industry leading in visualization tools, um, really allows you to take um, these huge data sets and make a meaningful inference from them and, and distill everything down into something that's uh, tangible for investigators to understand. One of the other really exciting things in the Epitope software is the ability to pull in um, other antibody attributes onto our proprietary network plots. So shown on the right here is a, it's a publication um, this past year, um, different um, a community network plots um, for antibodies. So each antibody is represented as a kind of node in these plots and the lines between them are blocking relationships. We can see that we have very discrete communities that don't have any um, sort of communication with others um, showing they're very discrete. And while within these communities, we can see that we have members that compete with each other indicating epitope overlap. Um, what you can do in these data sets in the software is bring in many other pieces of information that would help describe these antibodies in the context of epitope. For example, the library source, possibly expression levels, affinity, cross-species reactivity blockade. Really, there's no limit to how you can um, layer data on top of these network plots. So it's a hugely powerful tool for um, visualizing not only the epitopic landscape, but also other attributes of the antibodies that are meaningful for their selection criteria. And one other um, exciting feature, um, cool feature I, I would say that's in the software, Epitope software, is the ability to pull out sandwiching pairs. So this is just a screenshot of our, our Epitope binning software, Epitope. Uh, we have our heat map in the middle here. We've got our network plot on the right here of, of individual antibody nodes kind of showing competitive relationships. And then on the left here, one of the options within the software menus is the ability to pull out the sandwiching pair sets um, within these so we can find a, a ligand or an antibody which is on the surface, an analyte which is an antibody injected in solution, and do they form um, a sandwiching complex and is it symmetric? Um, so it's really, really a distilled down easy way to figure out um, not only where the epitope kind of clustering is occurring, but also just at a, at a very straightforward level, which pairs um, are potential options. Um, if you do need supporting reagents, for example, or if you're really going down the diagnostic path and wanted to really find some robust pairs. So that's my, um, my kind of quick introduction to the, the LSA system and its major applications in kinetics and epitope. Um, I'd like to switch gears a little bit and just before I hand everything back over to Aaron to wrap up, um, talk a little bit about maybe where Cartera's at in the, in the fight against COVID-19. Um, so we've had lots of customers, um, Twist obviously being one of them, that are heavily um, leveraging the LSA to, to meet the needs of, of COVID-19 research. Um, listed on the right here are just some sort of academic and public institutions that are involved. Um, we have numerous industry customers as well that are um, essential in running assays on the platform. Um, for example, the, the Eli Lilly antibody, the therapeutic that's gone in to phase one human trials is, um, phase one trials is actually, uh, was uh, characterized on the LSA, for example. So really exciting stuff. We're really um, encouraged at Cartera that we can be contributing in this effort. Um, the LSA has also been selected by the Gates Foundation, who's putting together a MAP consortium screening um, arrangement where, where it'll be the key platform there for uh, performing epitope binning and kinetic analysis of potential therapeutics um, in that effort. Um, and the last thing I'll touch on is the um, kind of expansion of LSA applications to serum-based assays. So we've seen, um, just as I've described, the sheer throughput of the LSA has meant that researchers are thinking beyond just simply discovering antibodies and characterizing them to how else can we leverage this platform to address COVID and one of those is serum-based research. So I'll highlight here um, uh, our paper that's actually, it's in uh, Nature Communications right now in review, um, but you can actually find it um, in pre-publication format on Research Square. Um, this is a, a group in the Netherlands that uh, used the LSA with a with an receptor binding domain um, chip surface to screen um, COVID-19 serum uh, from patients. Um, and basically the, the main goal of the assay was taking two molecular of serum 
they're looking for both um, the binding signals and, and particularly they're looking at uh, dissociation rates of the serum against uh, the receptor binding domain. So get, a, get an estimate of kind of how generally speaking, how affinity is looking towards, towards the SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domain. Um, and then also on the back end of it, calculating um, the isotype profiles of those antibodies. So looking at that immune response, understanding how tightly it's binding uh, in a way to RBD and, and secondarily kind of what is the immune response that's being elicited uh, versus IgG, IgM, and IgA. And here's just a little snippet of that data. Um, so looking at dissociation rate constants longitudinally across um, various patients, um, following onset of symptoms in this case. Um, so you can see that generally affinity, or I should say off rate is decreasing, meaning we're getting um, um, enhanced affinity towards uh, RBD over time for these patients, which is what we'd expect. Um, and then the black line shows the trend and colored lines are the individual longitudinal samples. Um, so really groundbreaking work. Um, there's a lot of assays out there, as everyone knows, looking at um, kind of patient samples, patient serum, um, but not a lot being discussed about what's changing in the patient over time and, and really leveraging uh, real-time binding to understand that. And as I mentioned, on the back half of this assay is the, the COVID-19 isotype monitoring. So in this, the same assay format, basically we take our, our 96 channel, multi-channel print head, we dock on the surface, we flow serum across, we bind out to the RBD, any, any RBD reactive antibodies, and then come in after that injection with um, injections of IgM, A and G across the surface. To, to measure binding levels. And you can see those shown here. Um, we kind of in the inset, we've got a, a large panel of species, but um, here we can see individual patients, the different profiles they have. So really fascinating stuff, really cool to see how patients change, um, profiles change over time and correlate with that with clinical outcomes. So that's just a little bit of offshoot, but um, just wanted to give everybody a heads up on kind of some exciting new stuff. Um, I'll hand it back over now to Aaron, who's going to go ahead and give you guys some really, really nice looking data that they've generated on the LSA and, and kind of show you guys how that's been helping their efforts there. Sorry. All right. All right, so uh, again, picking up my story. Um, so we did, again, pannings against the SARS-CoV-2 S1 protein we're using the hyperimmune library, um, this, the COVID library from uh, Vanderbilt. And then I'll talk later about how we used our single domain libraries. We made IgGs for all the positive hits. Um, and then we ran them on the Cartera to assess their affinity. Um, as Noah mentioned, you can mobilize the antibodies in different ways on the surface. A lot of people use anti-FC capture. We initially used direct coupling as well, where we directly coupled the antibody to the surface. And the reason why we're doing that is because we, we were planning to do epitope binning soon thereafter, which I'll again show you that data. So shown here is the, some of the affinity data for those antibodies, both against the S1 monomer protein, um, as well as S protein trimer. And so what you can see is we're you know, we're seeing, you know, nanomolar, picomolar affinities to either and or, you know, S1 protein or the uh, S protein trimer, again, indicating that we have high affinity binding to our target protein. Um, remember, I was talking before about um, specificity and how for diagnostics, specificity is actually really important. So uh, here we actually uh, initially looked to see whether our antibodies had any, had any cross reactivity with the original SARS uh, original SARS virus S1 protein, and all of our nearly all of our antibodies show no binding to the original SARS virus, except for two of them um, show some weak binding, shown here at TB1824 and TB1823, so show a little bit of binding to the original SARS virus, whereas all the others do not. So, actually, they're in, in some way ideal uh, for diagnostics because they would be very specific uh, for the target protein. It's just a blow up more of some of that kinetic data. Again, uh, some of our top hits that came out of uh, the work that we did. Um, these, all these leads actually came in from the hyperimmune library, um, which again is our fully human fab library. So TB1823 and four, as well as TB1827, they all bind the SARS S1 protein with either nanomolar or picomolar affinities. And then of course for trimer, as it says it's a multimer uh, of the S protein, it's, it, you see much more avid interaction with the LSA surface. And so we actually see in many cases, even sub nanomolar, picomolar binding to the S protein trimer. 
Um, another assay that's really nice and complementary um, with the LSA is ELISA. So we also do ELISAs in all of our antibodies. Um, you know, some antibodies work great when you mobilize them to the LSA surface, others do not, um, I think. Uh, whereas in our, in our, for us, ELISA always um, usually um, works. So it's a, it's a nice comparison and complementary assay uh, to the CAR-TERRA. And shown here is just that we interrogate all of our antibodies when ELISA did the ELISA titration, and from that we can get an EC50 for that, and actually then compare that back to the, the KD that we would determine um, using the CAR-TERRA. And so that's a, a nice double check um, of the assessment. And also for diagnostics, ELISA binding um, is usually a, a, a key and central assay that's often used to uh, pick specific clones that show really tight binding as a detector um, in a diagnostic assay. Okay, so then for the, the COVID library, as well as the hyperimmune library, we took all of those hits and then we did epitope binning. So as, as uh, Noah mentioned, we basically immobilized all the antibodies on the chip surface and then pre-mixed um, those same antibodies with the antigen, in this case, S1 protein. And we tried to see whether the, that those premixes were blocked in their binding um, to the antibodies on the surface. And so you can get this heat map um, and basically, heat, the, 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 of course, when you look at the heat map, you can wanna see, first of all, do all the antibodies compete with themselves, which they do. Um, so you can see down the diagonal, we see nice competition with themselves. And then you look to see uh, you know, which antibodies start competing with each other. And so you can see, for example, we have this control that we use from Acro that's a inhibitor of the S1 ACE2 interaction. It kind of sits up here in its own little bin. Um, there's an antibody uh, TB1 ACE4 that does show some competition with it that actually bridges it to another bin shown here, which has another large bin of antibodies that are also blockers of the S1 ACE2 interaction. Um, but then down here in this, in the, in the bottom right hand corner, there's a bunch of antibodies, including TB1 ACE7, which I showed before, that actually don't compete with S1 ACE2, but are high affinity binders and sit in their own separate bin. So, Again, this is a nice uh, way to look at, again, for diagnostics, you have antibodies up here that compete with that interaction, as well as antibodies down here that don't. Um, they're in separate bins. And so potentially they might make great sandwich pairs um, for developing, a, say for example, a sandwich ELISA to detect S1 protein. Um, another way to look at the data, um, so not every antibody uh, immobilizes really well on the chip surface and we can't always get great data, but what I have found is that um, competitions with the soluble protein that you do your premixes with, with the antibodies that are on the surface, that does work really well. So oftentimes um, if we're really interested in a, one particular capture antibody, let's say TB1827, um, we can then look at a whole series of different premixes with that one particular capture antibody and really dive in to see um, which ones show um, binding that other antibody in to form that uh, tri-molecular complex that Noah was talking about before. And so here um, we put TB1 and 7 on the chip surface. We made premixes with all of these antibodies in the table with S1 protein. And then what we're looking to see is do we see a signal above um, kind of the baseline level of S1 on its own? Um, and so S1 on its own is right here in this dark blue. Um, TB1827 with its self-lock, you can see that it shows a decrease in signal. And so then we're looking to see, are there any antibodies that show a signal on top of that, um, indicating that you can form that tri trimolecular complex of TB1 into new on the chip surface with the antigen and then a, that sandwich antibody on the top. So what you can see is there's a bunch of antibodies up here at the top of this table that show an enhanced normalized response compared to S1 alone. So that indicates, again, that they might make great sandwich pairs in conjunction with TB8, 1827 um, in an ELISA or other type of diagnostic assay. I'll just end with the VHH antibodies. Uh, again, we did this after we had done the IgG work. Um, we basically pan and screen all the, the two human uh, humanized VHH libraries against, again, the S1 spike protein, got a bunch of um, uh, hits with really great target tobacco ratios in ELISA. We also then ran them on Cartera. Um, you can see again um, here we actually used anti-FC capture um, using the S1 protein and we can see again nanomolar, picomolar binders um, to the S1 protein as well as again picomolar binders to the spike trimer because again we're seeing more of an avid interaction. So again really great performance um, of our single domain libraries against the spike protein. And then again, similar like I showed before, we did epitope binning. 
Uh, remember I told you before that that ACR antibody uh, kind of set off in its own little bin. We didn't actually find antibodies from our other libraries that were really in that central bin. Of course, we did find one antibody that kind of bridged it to with, with another bin. But what we found with our VHH antibodies is almost all of them, the leads we found, actually were in the same bin as that ACR antibody control. So again, the nice thing about having library libraries is we have different scaffolds, different diversities, and so that allows us to get, give us antibodies that bind uh, different potential epitopes on the target. And that's exactly what we saw in this case. Uh, we found a whole series of VHHs now that bind the same bin that the ACR antibody um, resides in. You can see again, uh, the other antibodies I talked about before um, set off in their own little bin, TB1 and 2 is down in this bin here. And then we actually did find one VHH that actually sits off uh, in its, on its own, um, separate from all those others as well. And so again, this gives us fantastic data to um, basically uh, use these uh, VHHs now in conjunction maybe with some of the IgGs that are in different bins to then develop a diagnostic assay. So just to summarize um, for SARS-CoV-2 S1, um, we got about 59 leads, IgG leads derived from um, all the work with hypermune library as well as the COVID library we did with Vanderbilt. Well, now also come up with over almost 200 VHHs as well, um, uh, derived from our uh, VHH single domain libraries. We have nanomolar picomolar binding. We have a, tons of therapeutic uh, uh, data that I didn't show because I was really trying to focus on diagnostics and really show you the power of the Cartera platform to, that enables us to um, really home in and find high affinity antibodies that are selective that can be used in sandwich pairs, which again are really key and central to developing a diagnostic test. And then finally, we're moving ahead um, on really both fronts with these antibodies, uh, both for therapeutics, which is kind of uh, uh, the path there is pretty, uh, you know, it's very well known. And like, so we're moving ahead to doing uh, viral testing and in vivo studies uh, in the very near future. Um, and then uh, from diagnostics, trying to, we're offering these antibodies up to everybody that wants them um, through a catalog IgG offering. You can actually go online very soon and actually purchase these antibodies for your own diagnostic tests and research use. So uh, please check them out and um, purchase them if you have any need for using these antibodies in your own diagnostic tests. So I'll just end with ways you can work with Twist Biopharma. Of course, all the libraries I talked about today are up for licensing. So if, you, if you're uh, you know, skilled in the art of phage display, you can easily license them from us and do the lab in your own uh, facility. Um, we all, all, of course, have our own um, top-notch team that can use these libraries to discover antivirus for you and deliver them to you. Um, we also can do, I didn't talk about it today, but we have, a, again, as I said, a whole platform for doing antibody optimization using our Tau platform that we can use to help you optimize antibodies we're doing a lot of work with uh, doing proof of concept around the libraries and actually developing leads from them, which we are actively trying to license. Um, I didn't mention it today, but we do have a whole separate um, custom library team where we can generate, you can generate your own libraries. And so you can actually utilize the um, biopharma team to help you with those screening efforts. And then finally, we're kicking off a new alpha product at Twist to do high throughput antibody production. So this idea of not only synthesizing the DNAs and coding for specific genes, but also the antibodies themselves. And so if you have a need for large numbers of antibodies as part of your screening efforts, definitely follow up with your Synbio sales rep. And I'll end there and I'd be happy to answer any questions. And I know Noah would also be very uh, happy to answer questions as well. Thank you, Aaron, and, and thank you, Nara, as well, for, for two uh, really interesting presentations. Uh, so we are going to take some questions now. Just a reminder to our audience, if you have questions, you can post them in the Q&A box at the bottom, uh, and we'll try to get through them now. If, if when you have finished as well, if you can take a moment to answer our, our survey, that would be much appreciated. So first of all, um, quick question for Aaron. Um, so obviously, uh, this, the, the pandemic has accelerated the speed at which people want to do this work. Um, so how, fr from point of, of beginning the project to having the antibodies in hand, how long did it take? And, and would you say that's typical or, you know, would you expect there to be a high degree of variability in terms of how quickly Twist Biopharma can go from pro project inception to, to having some high efficacy or high specificity candidates? Um, the one good thing we had in our favor is that the, 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 the S1 proteins are highly antigenic, so it's immunogenic. So... Um, we were able to very quickly 
uh, build the libraries because again we we, we sit instead of a DNA company, and then we were able to then pan and screen it, and we got tons of hits. So um, we were able to do that in a six-week time frame, which again it really shows you the speed of our overall process. Um, but then, uh, as a target on its own, the S1 spike protein was a pretty you know, easier target compared to others. So that wasn't an inhibitory step in the process, but um, we had all the automation, everything in place to really um, motor really fast um, once we had built the library for the COVID-19 library with Vanderbilt. And then finally, we, had, we pulled off a bunch of antibody libraries off the shelf and were able to use them to quickly interrogate them to find leads. So in a very short period of time, in a matter of six weeks, we actually had some of our initial hits in hand. Amazing. Um, okay, so you, you mentioned one of the key things with uh, diagnostics is to, to look at the specificity of the of the antibodies and, and this sort of pertains to a question that's come in as well about using the LSA so has it been possible to to look at the uh, how these antibodies perform in in serum for example and um, you know uh, Noah talked a little bit about that so I guess I, I'd, I'd perhaps direct that question to Aaron first of all and then ask if, if that was a something you'd, you'd, you'd want to do on the LSA. Yeah, I think looking at the binding in different uh, matrices is just something you can easily do in the Cartera. I think, you know, for example, trying to see if the antibodies bind well in serum, maybe saliva, um, different testing, like basically, under, you know, do, run, the, run the kinetics and the binding in the presence mm -hmm. of, the, of the matrix that you'll be doing your diagnostic test in. Um, I think that easily could be done. We haven't done that ourselves, um, but I think, again, and Noah can speak to this, I think that that could be done quite easily on the system. Yep, yeah, I echo those sentiments, Aaron. Yep, it's definitely the best way to really understand um, the performance of those various matrices. And really with serum um, or any, any sort of complex matrices uh, for label-free biosensors, there's always been a concern that, um, you know, that's a complex sample matrices and, and it could be not ideal for microfluidics. But in reality, if the, the, the um, <clears throat> The samples are the serum, for example, is, is filtrated, just a 0.2 micron filter. There's usually no issue with running samples like that on a, on a biosensing platform, uh, such as the LSA. So yeah, definitely a very, uh, a very good assay, essential assay, I would argue, um, to perform mm -hmm. and definitely doable on the system. Okay. Um, you, you show, uh, Noah, a, a comparison to the, the beer core data. Have mm -hmm. you compared the LSA to uh, other sort of similar systems, such as the Octet, for example, as well. One of the questions coming in. Yeah. One of our um, good question. I don't think, um, and that was, for example, that that particular set of experiments was run through Atomab and Amgen. I don't know if there is a head-to-head -head kinetics of the two platforms. Um, usually, SPR is a little more uh, the gold standard for kinetics, and and typically, I want to say just typically, um, octets are, are really uh, focused on kind of the dip and read and kind of yes, no data. So I don't believe I'm aware of something in the literature doing a head to head quite, quite the way it was done in that um, particular manuscript. Okay. Um, so Aaron, if I can jump back onto the libraries and uh, for a moment. So a question from one of our uh, attendees. So what was the criteria for choosing uh, VH323 and VK139 as the scaffold? Uh, for example, did they have better stability or high yield? Yeah, there. If you look at the most marketed approved antibodies out on the market today, the most of them are VH three twenty three V cap one thirty nine. They're the most common used, and so and they're also highly developable. So they express well. They're very developable. Um, they they're well behaved. So that's that's kind of why we made our initial libraries off of those scaffolds. Fantastic, and. Um, similar sort of question which is what is the best affinity coming out of naive libraries so what what might be i, I mean i honestly i guess it can can vary depending on what you're you're working on but um do you have a, a range that you're you're shooting for um yeah again typically what i see with a target is you know nanomol single digit nanomolar is a good benchmark so if you can get that from initial naive library that's a that's a good that's a good result. Um, I think for, for the COVID antibodies, you know, we're able to see that we're able to get below that. And as I said, I think the spike protein is just very immunogenic. So um, it's not hard to get antibodies down in that range. Um, so, uh, but other targets are not as amenable. So um, it really, it's really target dependent. Um, and so I think 
having lots of different libraries with different diversities, some of which might be successful, some of which might not be, is really key and central to any discovery campaign. Mm. Okay. And then uh, uh, another question, again, on the libraries is, if these libraries have been cloned, how do you ensure the diversity of the library isn't compromised due to that cloning step? Is there a... Um, yeah, like I said, uh, we do NGS sequencing of the final library. So that gives us a nice read on the quality, the you know, read numbers of specific sequences. Um, it, it allows us to really make sure that what we design matches up with what is actually in the tube. Um, and so that, that gives us a really firm grasp of what the initial starting point of the library. And as, also as we pan the library, we'll do NGS sequencing as well. So we'll see kind of how those sequences evolve um, and, you know, and change mm. um, in terms of the starting so population so, versus what, we, what comes out. So it's quality in, it's quality out in that, in that respect. Okay, um, final question. Um, so have you worked to develop antibodies to coronavirus nuclear capsid protein? Um, uh, great question. Um, we're working on that right now. Um, you know, we're the two most abundant pro the proteins, the most abundant protein on the, the virus is the nucleocapsid protein. Uh, and we're also taking, undertaking a, a campaign on the M protein, which is the most common membrane protein. Um, so those are two great targets that we're going to be going after. I think we're going to be focused primarily on our uh, single domain libraries for that. And uh, again, be on the lookout for that data that'll be coming out very soon. Okay. Well, on that note, um, we're coming up on the hour. Um, and so I think we'll, we'll leave the questions there for now. Uh, there are a few additional questions that we will try to follow up by email to just uh, to address those. Uh, again, if you want to reach out to uh, Noah directly, you can reach him at info at cartera biocom And of course, you can find Aaron and myself at twistbioscience.com. Uh, so thank you for joining us today. Please do take a few moments to fill in our survey. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Noah, for, for great presentations. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you all at the next webinar. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.